Hey, good morning, church. Thank you so much for joining us today, and welcome to our new series called Unbelievable. The idea behind this series is that we want to tackle the difficult questions, perhaps the obstacles that would cause people to say, you know what, that God stuff is nice, but I'm just not sure I'm able to embrace it. I'm just not sure I'm able to throw my whole life behind this Jesus thing. So what we want to do over the course of the next four weeks is really tackle some of those difficult issues, some of those difficult questions. And one of the ways we want to do that is by inviting you to ask us your tough questions. And so over the next few weeks, please send in your questions via email. Um, and, And if you have friends that are not followers of Jesus, this might be a great opportunity for you to have a Jesus conversation with them and just kind of ask, so what are your hang-ups, what are the reasons why you're holding out on following Jesus, and get some of those questions. Remember, the only bad question is a question that's not asked, right? So our last message in this series on uh, Memorial Day weekend, we're going to sit up here with a group of pastors from the church and just kind of talk through those, process through those, try the best that we can to shed light and bring understanding on some of those questions that makes it unbelievable for some people to follow Jesus, And the reason why this is so important is because even Jesus' own disciples found it unbelievable that he had risen from the dead. The disciples that had walked with Jesus, that had talked with him, that had seen him minister, when Christ rose, all four Gospels show disbelief and doubt in the disciples. And for me, this paradoxically is one of the most convincing proofs of the truth of the Gospels. Because here you have people that are writing these Gospels about the life of Jesus in order to provoke faith, to inspire people to believe, yet they are including the stories of their own doubt and discouragement and struggle to find faith after meeting the resurrected Jesus. Now, if they were just kind of trying to whitewash a story or make it seem totally believable, they wouldn't include that. The only explanation is that they were actually recording their experience of faith and doubt all mixed together. In Matthew's gospel, the great commission where Jesus sends the disciples and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. The verse right before that, Matthew 28, 17 says, When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. There was doubt mixed in that sending of the great commission. In Mark's gospel, at the very end, when the ladies saw the tomb, it says they ran from the tomb out of fear and didn't say anything because they were so afraid. In John's gospel, Peter and some of the other disciples went to their old life back in fishing after Peter had denied Jesus, and they found it difficult to believe that he had risen from the dead. And today, we're going to look in the gospel of Luke and see how some of the disciples struggled with doubt and disbelief and how Jesus met them in that place. And the way that Jesus talked to them and spoke to them and encouraged them gives us hope for you and I where we sometimes struggle to find our faith truly believable. So turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to see an awesome story of Jesus walking with the disciples and encouraging them and opening their eyes in the midst of their unbelief. Luke chapter 24, and as you're going there, How many of you have ever seen the show Undercover Boss? Anyone see that? We love to watch that as a family. We get a kick out of it. So the idea, the premise behind the show is that uh, the CEO of certain corporations, they kind of disguise themselves. They go undercover in their organization, and they kind of do everything from beginning to end and, and learn along the way where are the sticky spots. And, and one of the coolest things about this show is that the employees, they don't know that this is really the boss of the company, and they open up, and they share stuff that they probably wouldn't share if they knew who they were talking to. So in today's message, Jesus is going to go undercover boss on the disciples. He's going to show up to them on the road to Emmaus, and they are not going to recognize him. And as a result of that, they're going to start opening up. They're going to start sharing some of their doubts. They're going to start sharing some of their disbelief. And Jesus is going to walk them through that, help them unpack that, and then give the big reveal. At the end of Undercover Boss, there's always the big reveal where he, he, they, they show that this is the CEO and the employee's kind of mind is blown. So that's going to happen today in Luke chapter 24, where we're picking up in our story in verse 13 is the disciples 
Two of the disciples, this is not two of the 12, they're, they're other followers of Jesus. After they heard that the tomb was empty, they start out towards this town called Emmaus, which is out of the town. It says this in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, that's a really curious thing. These were disciples of Jesus. They had walked with him. They knew him. Why in the world would they not recognize him? Well, there's probably two things at least going on here. One is that there's this theme running through the book of Luke about the, the way that people cannot come to God on their intellect Alone. It's not just figuring it out on your own. So there's just kind of this idea that runs through Luke from the beginning that people often are veiled in their understanding. They don't quite see, they don't quite connect the dots until Jesus reveals himself, until Jesus opens his eyes. And that's going to happen towards the end of this passage. But I think there's something else that's going on here as well. And I think that one of the reasons the disciples did not recognize Jesus was because of the depth of of their discouragement. They had hoped that Jesus would rise from the dead, and despite the, the testimony of the women in the empty tomb, they couldn't believe that it actually had happened, and they believed that the Messiah's mission had failed because he died on a cross. They didn't understand that he had told them that these things were going to happen. So they were discouraged. And one of the things we see in Scripture is that when we are discouraged, we sometimes get distracted from seeing God's presence and God's work in our midst. In Exodus, when Moses came to the people, they were deeply discouraged. And despite the signs and the miracles and the ways that he had pointed to them, it says that Moses reported this, meaning God's plan to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. You see, one of the things that makes faith unbelievable is our circumstances and the discouragement that we can get sucked into sometimes, and we lose sight of where God is in those moments. And I believe that's where the disciples were when Jesus showed up to them and began walking alongside them. So we pick up the story as we continued. Verse 17, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk about? They stood still. Their faces downcast. Now as we go through this passage, see if you can pick up some of the areas, the reasons why they were discouraged or some of the evidence. Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened in these days? What things, Jesus asked. I've got to picture Jesus trying to keep a straight face as he's talking to these guys. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped, past tense, that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our own women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. So three ways that I think we can see some evidence of their discouragement. First of all, their direction. They were headed to Emmaus, which was seven miles outside of Jerusalem. That would be like us hiking from here to the Casper Event Center. It's about seven miles away. They were going in the wrong direction. Jesus had told them he was going to rise. They, they heard about the empty tomb, but they figured that they didn't see Jesus, so he must not be alive. The second thing that we see their discouragement is we look at their body language. In verse 17 it says, they stood still and their faces were downcast. They were slumped over. They were discouraged. They had hoped. They were disappointed that what they had hoped apparently wasn't coming true. And the third way that we could see their discouragement is 
They were pretty rude to Jesus. When you look at the original language about how they talk to him, when they say, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know about the things that have happened? The word visitor is foreigner, but it's used in a very negative way. It's like, you're not from here, are you? And the irony is that Jesus is the one that all these things are happening about, and he's the one that knows what's going on, and they don't. I had a situation like this a few weeks ago. My family and I went to visit some friends in Colorado. They live up on the mountains, and we were having dinner. And it was one of those times that something just came out of my mouth. And as soon as I said it, I realized I shouldn't have said that. And, and I had asked, you see, the day before, the Mueller report came out. And uh, so we were at dinner, and I, I, I asked, I said, so what would you think of the Mueller report? And as soon as I said it, I got simultaneously the death look of my wife, and, and I put my hand up to catch the taco that was going to fly across the table and hit me in the face. But I wasn't prepared for their answer. My friend looked at me and said, what's the Mueller report? And I said, are you only a, a visitor, a stranger, and you do not know the things that are happening these days? No, I didn't say that. But I wanted to. And my bacon was saved, and so were my tacos that night, because we were able to change the subject. Maybe it's because they live out in the mountains. Maybe it's something in the air in Colorado. I don't know. But thankfully, you know, thankfully, um, I didn't have to suffer for that one. So... Jesus now begins to explain to the disciples and help them connect the dots. Jesus said to them in verse 25, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus started way back from the early scriptures, the writings of Moses, until his time, and explained, he connected the dots. You guys remember being in preschool, doing the connect the dots? I used to love those. Those were so cool. So it'd be like this, this picture, and, uh, and you had to kind of draw the numbers, and you look at it, and, the, and Jesus is like walking them through the scriptures, and they're like, yeah, it, it's, um, yeah, we just... We're not sure, Jesus, can you help us out here? And, and so he starts to walk them through. There's over 300 prophecies in Scripture about the Messiah, where he was going to be born, how he was going to be born, what his life was going to be like, the fact that he was going to be betrayed, the, the details about the crucifixion, what they were going to offer him on the cross. They were going to cast lots for his clothing, how he was going to come in during the triumphal entry. I mean, Jesus fulfilled it all. And he explained to the disciples, don't you guys, don't you get it? Aren't you able to put it together? And the word that he uses, how foolish you are, literally means how unmindful. He says, not of the mind, meaning they, they had it in there, but they weren't connecting the dots. Their discouragement made it difficult for them to see how this all fit together. And I think what Jesus was trying to tell them was this. The main point of our message today, and if you're following along in your outline, is this. That if our stories are not shaped by Scripture, they will be shaped by our circumstances. If our stories, if our lives are not shaped by Scripture, by God's Word, they will be shaped by our circumstances. If we are not locating ourselves in the bigger picture of God's story, of creation and redemption and new creation. It's easy to get stuck and lose sight and get trapped in what's swirling around us at the moment like the disciples did and lose sight of what God is actually doing. Now this happened to us in a powerful, powerful way. I mean, stories all throughout my life, but, but this time last year, and I shared this a little bit in the last sermon I did, but this time last year, we were upended um, as a family when we lost the house that we had been living in and, and raised our kids in and suddenly we're out and needed to find a new place to live and our rent doubled trying to find somewhere in LA but that year starting January 1st we decided as a family we're going to just start listening to the scripture one chapter a night at dinner well 
About week two, chapter 11, chapter 12 of Genesis, it was right at the time when we were told, hey, you, gotta go, you guys got to find somewhere else to live. And that was just like this huge shock to us. Well, we had heard the story that night of Abraham where God said, you're going to leave your place and go to the place that I'm going to show you. You don't know yet, but follow me and I will show you where that is. We're like, oh my gosh. As we kept on listening to the story, the night we read this story of the Passover in Exodus where the, uh, God told them they had to tuck their uh, cloaks in their belt and hurry and leave and take all their possessions with them. That was the day that we literally had to move into this new house. So we were like, guys, we're, we're living the Exodus. Get, you're ready. Get, get all the stuff. Don't leave anything behind. And we were going. A couple of weeks later, as we were working through Exodus and chapter after chapter and week after week of building the tabernacle and, and the tent poles and, 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 and how long and how high the curtains were. And our kids are like, is this ever going to end? Well, um, we, one night we were listening and, and our, our youngest asked us, so, so how long are we going to be in, in this house, in this house that we're renting? And we're like, well, well, you know, we don't know. And we listened to the story that night. And the story was the cloud, whenever the cloud departed from the tabernacle, that the people followed it. If it stayed a few days, they stayed a few days, a few weeks, a few months. We're like, we told them, hey, kids, we don't know, but however long the cloud stays, we stay. When the cloud moves, we move. And our youngest is like, well, what happens if it's at night and we can't see the cloud? My wife's like, well, there'll be a pillar of fire. And so we kind of, we're like going through the story, and no joke, I'm not making this up. Uh, by this time, we were in conversation with Highland, and we were invited to come out um, and interview. And two nights before we came out, we were in, I mean, we made it through Leviticus. We made it through infectious skin diseases. We were, you know, we didn't listen to that at dinner because we wouldn't have eaten. But, you know, by the time we're in numbers, two nights before we came out, it was a story of Moses sending the spies into the promised land. And he told them, check out the land. What are the people like? How are their houses? And, and go spy it out. And we're like, hey, mom and I are going to go spy out the land now. And so we didn't come back with the big clusters of grapes. But we did come back with the report after meeting Pastor Mike that there were giants in the land. <laughs> and so we just felt like, man, God was walking us through this story like the scripture was shaping our reality. And I can't imagine trying to go through that experience without God's leading and guidance. And how does he do it? The Holy Spirit says that the word of God is living and active means it interacts with us in our story. And if you're faithful to take time and soak in Scripture, God is faithful to make it come alive in your life. And so the disciples had disconnected themselves from this larger story that Jesus said, look, all this had to take place. And yes, suffering was part of it for the Messiah to enter into his glory. And we lose sight of that. We believe, well, if I say yes to Jesus, then everything is going to go well. Well, Jesus showed us himself that part of what it means to follow God in faithfulness and obedience includes suffering. In fact, in Hebrews it says that though he was a son, Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. And that was actually the very part the disciples had the most difficulty with. In fact, every time in Mark's gospel that Jesus told them that he was going to suffer and die, the disciples three times in a row changed the subject to talk about who of them was the greatest. They were talking about ascent, and Jesus was talking about descent into a deeper reality and experience of God to understand his resurrection power. And Paul eventually got it, and he said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing with him in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. You see, Paul understood that suffering was part of the story. And we shouldn't just get lost in our circumstances without understanding where we fit in the story. And so now Jesus is going to give the big reveal. This is the part of Undercover Boss at the very end where he sits down with the employees and, and, and they play back the tape and this is what's going to happen. Jesus is going to reveal himself now to the disciples in verse 26. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. He should get an academy. I mean, this is good stuff, right? Jesus is doing a good job. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. 
They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and said, it is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized them when he broke the bread. So Jesus sits down with them for a meal. And normally the host would be the one to take the bread. But Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them. Do you remember what happened at the feeding of the 5,000? The little boy gave Jesus the bread. Said Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. And he gave it to them. Do you remember what happened at the Last Supper when Jesus took the bread? He gave thanks. He broke it. And he gave it to them. They were like, wait a minute. We've seen this before. And when he gave it to them, they're like, yeah, Jesus, right? And then he disappeared from their sight. Luke likes to record stories of teletransporting in in Acts 6. Stephen preaches to the Ethiopian eunuch and then disappears. And so Jesus disappears, and they're all the way seven miles away at the Casper Event Center. They're like, now we got to go back to Jerusalem and tell the disciples what had happened. And while they're telling the story, Jesus shows up to them. And they're like, it's a ghost. And he's like, it's not a ghost, it's me. And they're like, prove it. And he's like, you got anything to eat? And they're like, yeah. And they gave him fish and he ate it. And they're like, whoa, he can eat, which is awesome. It's really cool that in the resurrection we'll be able to eat. I'm so glad about that for eternity, right? And no gaining weight. And so, um, so Jesus is there, and then it says he opened their minds that they could understand the scripture. So I love what it says where they said, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked to us on the road about the scriptures. See, there was something going on at a deep, deep level that they weren't able to make the connection mentally, but something was stirring within them as Jesus was talking. And then Luke says in verse 30, 33, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Only the word Luke uses for got up, it's really curious. He doesn't just say like they got up, like they stood up or they got up from their chair. The word Luke uses fascinatingly is the same root word for resurrection. They rose up. They were resurrected and returned to Jerusalem. It's the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians 5.14 when he says, Wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. After meeting the resurrected Jesus, the disciples resurrected. They were raised up. They finally got it. God revealed himself to them in a powerful way. And I just love how Luke uses that word to explain what took place after they encountered the risen Jesus. So here we are today. And you and I, like the disciples, live in a broken and fallen world. We live in a world where things don't go the way that we would always like them to go. We live in a world where relationships get broken. We live in a world where there sometimes just isn't enough, aren't enough finances. We live in a world where our body breaks down. And it's difficult in those times to understand, God, what are you doing? Why are you not seeming to intervene? Why are you not seeming to help in this situation? And it's easy to get our focus on our circumstances and miss the bigger picture of what God is up to. So here's what I want to encourage you to do today. I believe that there are two important things that we can do to help us capture a sense of where God is in our difficult circumstances and in our discouragement. And the first one is that we need to be shaped by Scripture. We need to be shaped by Scripture. We need to let God's Word be our ground, our reality, and the story in which we find and connect our story to understand from beginning to end our place in this unfolding drama as we await the return of Christ, as we await the redemption through Christ, as we await what God is doing. In the midst of that, God has given us his word to help us understand what it means to persevere, what it means to stay faithful, what it means to trust even when we don't see or understand where he is. We need to be shaped by scripture. And I just want to give you a simple acronym for how you can do that. The word SOAP. Um, So you start with scripture. And I encourage you to get one of those little dollar journals at the store, whatever. And each day as you open the scriptures, just read a chapter a day and, and look at scripture. And then the O stands for observation. What are your observations about the scripture? What do you notice about God? What are you noticing about yourself? What do you notice about the world around you? Just make some observations from the reading, questions perhaps that you have. 
The A stands for application. Okay, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for me? How does God want me to live differently now in light of this? I was um, a couple weeks ago reading through scripture, reading through the Lord's Prayer when it says, uh, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. And, and I was just sitting there with that. And God brought to mind somebody from a couple years ago, a pretty deep betrayal. And I hadn't thought of it in a while. And I had to say, okay, or this, this isn't just written because, but I need to apply this. And then the P was for prayer, and I was able to say, God, I can't do this on my own. And I was able to release that. It was just such a tremendous sense of, of freedom that happened. But when we get to Scripture, again, we understand that it's living and active, and God interacts with us through the Scripture. And he brings to mind all of his truth to come to bear on our lives and our circumstances. So be shaped by Scripture. And the second thing I want to encourage you to do is to process your discouragement with God. See, when we go through difficulties, sometimes we think, you know what, I can't, I can't take this to God. I can't bring this to him because I don't want to upset him. I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to make him feel bad. And so we kind of hold this stuff in. And, and like the disciples, Jesus walked along with them and talked with them and helped them process. I mean, you see this all the way through Scripture. He did it with Moses. He did it with Elijah when Elijah was, was just discouraged and at the end. And the disciples, too. We need to be able to process our discouragement with God. And so here's a little outline of how you can do that. Uh, just a, just a three-part prayer. And we're just going to give you an opportunity to practice that now. So the first is, God, I feel discouraged because... I feel discouraged because what is it that's going on in your life right now that you're willing to tell God, you know what, this is not the way that I had hoped it turned out. And then the second part is I had hoped. And you can do this mentally, verbally with God. You could write it uh, in your outline as you're, as you're working. We're going to give you a minute or so to practice this. And the third part is open my eyes to see. Open my eyes to see where you're working Open my eyes to see what I'm not seeing. Open my eyes to see how scripture can come to bear on this situation. Open my eyes to see where you're at. I just want to give you a minute or so to just take some time and process with God right now, right where you're at. Anything that you're discouraged about, anything that has been difficult for you lately. And after we do that, the worship team is going to lead us in a closing song called Living Hope. That's just a reminder that the resurrected Christ is our hope. We might not see where he's at right now. But the Bible tells us that he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So take this time to process with God. Let him meet you where you are. Let him speak to you.